My name's Dave DeBow, founder of MoneyPartnerFormula.com, and this show is built for everyday real estate investors who are actively doing deals and looking to scale using other people's money. So if you're an active real estate investor and you want to get featured on the show to talk about your own real estate and capital raising experiences, then just go to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now let's get rolling with this episode and remember to subscribe for daily interview content. All right, guys, welcome to Property Profits Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Kaminsky, filling in for Dave Dubo. And have you ever wondered how someone overcame homelessness and battled epilepsy to become a successful real estate entrepreneur? Well, today, my guest, Jimmy Jackson from Grand Rapids, he's got an incredible story of resilience and triumph in the face of adversity. So stick around, Jimmy. Welcome to the show. Thrilled to have you here. Let's dive into it. Cool. Thank you for uh, the invite, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. So um, I guess the, I, I, I got a couple of interesting questions. Like we can dive into like the, the different things about the epilepsy and the homelessness, but like, how did you get started in real estate? Okay. Yeah. That's a great question, man. Um, well, I got started in real estate because, um, I learned that, um, like I believe like 80% was the statistic then. I don't know exactly what the current, uh, current statistic is, but, um, they said that like 80% of successful people who have my condition, um, epilepsy Mm -hmm. that become successful are entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to figure out, you know, what the most successful way to become an entrepreneur is. And, um, I was just searching around and searching around and cause you know, when you have a condition like mine, you can't be a bus driver. You can't be a, yeah. uh, can't be a garbage man. You know, you can't be a police officer. I tried to join the military at a, at a young age and they told me, you know, I, I couldn't do it when I, I tried to, um, apply for the Marines. And one day I was watching the CNBC, um, a, uh, real estate, they were talking about CNBC real estate. And there was a guy out in Arizona and he was one of the first people who had like DoorDash drivers and Uber drivers and Lyft drivers that were making him a ton of money. So they did a special on him and they were talking about how the idea was genius. And I'm like, wow, because with my condition, I didn't have a driver's license. I had mm-hmm. gotten a car accident when I, cause I've had a, a couple of seizures driving. So I didn't drive for six years. Mm-hmm. So when I seen that, I'm like, well, if I can't drive, you know, maybe I can find people who can drive for me. <laughs> so that's what first so you got a driver exactly so well yeah. they have the self-driving tesla now so you just hold the handles and it'll take you uh, <laughs> anywhere you go right. i drove one in florida it was it blew my mind literally you close your eyes that thing will take you wherever you go you just put in the gps the thing will drive you wherever you're going so that's something to think about now how do you how do you manage um you know without a driver's license you have people picking you up to take you to properties or do you build, have you built your business to limit your travel? Well, I actually have my driver's license now. I went, okay. I had to go a year without it. It just, you know, that, that's how I got my, my um, interest in real estate. Like when I heard that, it like hit a switch and I'm like, what is this? And then I watched Jerry Norton's videos, like, uh, you know, like a lot of people. And at that time, a lot of people didn't know what wholesaling was. They didn't. Mm. You know, it hadn't caught the big wave like it's on right now. So Yeah, it's definitely on a wave. I mean, it's not easy. Anyone can try to get on the wave, but can they stand up on the board or are they just going to get wiped out by that wave? Because <laughs> as a wholesaler, you know, every year you see people roll in and fold out, roll in and fold out because this business, uh, anyone can do it. But like surfing, anyone can do that too. Can you be good at it? Can you survive? Are you going to break your back on some crashing wave? So um, is that how you got started is with wholesaling? Yeah. Yep. That's how I got started was with wholesaling. Um, I mean, you know, all, you know, you see all those marketing, you don't need no money, zero dollars down, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. blah. Which you actually, you're going to need money. So I don't care what they say. You need money. Well, you or can at least get, skip tracing. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's just put the, 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 the caveat there. You can do it with no money. Is it harder? Yes. Is it yeah, possible? Yeah. yeah. But if you're going to have a business, you're going to have to, like any business, you got to put money in to get money out, uh, usually in marketing. So 
Um, at what point did you start financing your wholesaling to really blow it up? Um, well, when I could have, like when I had enough money to start putting it into like prop stream, mm -hmm. you know, skip tracing. Cause you know, I needed, you know, I'm going to co-sign. First of all, I just want to, you know, co-sign to what Bryce just said. You definitely can get it started without any money. It's just, you know, you need, uh, you know, money for the basics, kind of like putting gas in your car. You know what yeah. I mean? Like if you want to make it from point A to point B. Yeah, you know, you can either catch the bus, you can walk, you can ride your bike. So it's always possible to get where you want to get. It's just how you're going to get there. So mm -hmm. for sure. But So prop stream was the big one you invested in first. That's what you would say if people are like looking to get started. Prop stream, skip tracing. How much did that cost to get off the ground for you? Um, It was a hundred bucks a month for the, oh, well, and, and then paying for the, you know, the contacts and prop stream, you got to pay for yeah. the, you know, all the contacts you they want. They give you so. some, I heard, I haven't actually dived into that. I, I, I just signed up yesterday, no, Sunday. So two days ago, um, I'm going to see what it's like, we don't, I'm from Canada. We don't have prop stream. <laughs> We don't have the ability to look people up or do skip traces. We have to just literally knock on doors and put flyers out. Like it's all locked down. So it's a, it's a different game up here, but totally doable. But again, it does take a marketing spend, you know, flyers, uh, ad spend on like Google ads and stuff like that. So it's a different game, but certainly there's a, there's a certain spend um, to get going now. What sort of challenges have you had to deal with with battling uh, epilepsy in the business? How does it, you know, determine your real estate career? Really just the ups and downs at the time. Um, it was like the inconsistency, like I'd be doing good. And then, you know, the stress, it, like if I if I'm taking like, well, I'm doing like I said, I'm doing a lot better now, but at the time, you know, taking on too much, not getting enough sleep, trying to handle too many things at once would cause seizures. And if you have, you know, if you, if you have a seizure, you can be tired for two or three days. Like you don't want to get yeah. up. It's, you know, you know, it's kind of like your, I guess a good analogy is like a computer, you know, like if your computer, you know, like the screen glitches as a crash or something. Off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you're like, well, what the hell's going on with my computer? And then it finally turns back on and then, you know, it's not working for a couple of days kind of like how your brain is except for it's tired it, you need to regroup so I, i'd have to say so that's that like a stress that's a stress response or you find that it could happen any really any time but stress increases the likelihood so you so how do you manage the stress of real estate which can at times i'm not even gonna say can at times is a somewhat stressful let's take somewhat is a stressful business to be <laughs> in entrepreneurship so how do you manage the stress well, just recently, um, I quit my other job. So now I only do real estate because I was working third shift. So I was working all night. And But now to to answer your question, um, I, I don't have as much stress. So, you know, I'd be sleeping not that many hours because I was, I was a high school basketball coach too. So I'd be going from third shift to get out of work. Then I go to basketball. Then I do real estate. But now I can focus on me you know so yeah. that really brought the stress levels down and i've reached the higher point of success where i i'm living more comfortably but i but now i have to stay disciplined now it's i say it's more about discipline than stress now what i'd say that those tables have turned yeah so we're gonna dive in a little bit into your into the stuff that you submitted as part of like the 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 research here and we can skip it if you want but your father's experience going, you know, going to prison, what sort of impact uh, did that have on like your life and your career choices? Um, well, I mean, my dad was very good, you know, very good uh, role model in like the business field. Like he, you know, like we couldn't go anywhere without my dad knowing people. So mm -hmm. my dad taught me a lot of good things. Mm -hmm. I just want to point that out first. Um, and then, he showed me what to do and he showed me what not to do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it did have an impact. Um, but at the same time, I learned a lot from my dad from what not to do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I think we learned from our parents, both sides, even my dad, great, great guy done, done, you know, really showed me a lot. 
but we always learn, you know, we always learn a little bit about, and that's what we hope for our kids, right? That they don't take on the, what we, our mistakes and they really just polish and really refine what it is that, that we can bring to the table and just like, don't do as I do, do as I say, uh, get off the coffee table. I don't stand on coffee tables, neither should you. So, um, <laughs> me, me neither. So, um, let's talk a little bit about where the business is these days. Have you started moving from wholesale deals into d joint ventures and creative finance, that sort of thing? <clears throat> yeah. Yep. That, that's what I did. Um, I did the, my first wholesale deal. Um, and when I didn't have anything, you know, I didn't have anything to put into it. So I had a good friend. Uh, I always like to give him a shout out, shout out to break house properties you know, you know who you are, bro. So without you, I couldn't have done this. But um, I turned to him and was like, hey, <clears throat> I see a deal. What do you think about it? Mm -hmm. And I I think that he wanted to see me succeed more than the opportunity in the deal. <laughs> I mean, the deal, it, it turned out to be a good deal. But I, I think he's seen the potential in me and what I did. Because only 1% of one of only 1% of people I read online can complete a wholesale deal out of all the people that go and say they're gonna be wholesalers, only 1% mm -hmm. is said on Google actually get a wholesale deal. So I think he's seen the confidence. And he's seen the value that I had the that I could potentially bring. So after I did the wholesale deal, I kind of had a vibe that I could turn to him if I needed something. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I found a um, woman who was a hoarder. Her house was like something you see on those hoarder shows, bro. Like, yeah. Oh my yeah. God, dude. Yeah. You I know remember what I mean? we did a hoarder house once and uh, it got to the point where we were just throwing things out the second floor window onto the front yard because it like carrying it downstairs and through the door. Like, no, nah, it was just going right out the window. Got junk would show up clear the front yard every like six hours and we were just emptying that thing right out so how did you uh did you end up flipping that property yeah yeah well what we did was um we came to her and said hey you know you're behind you're almost going to go into foreclosure yeah so um he got a hold of his lawyers we found out that the the there was prior liens on the property but mm. um we wouldn't have to worry about those uh, and he he liked my deal. I came to him and said, "Hey, there's a big opportunity in this property. There's a zero dollar mortgage balance, and the property has a value of two hundred and sixty thousand. I said she's willing to take twenty thousand for this property, bro, because she's wow. in a tight situation. Oh yeah, she's in a really tight situation, and she was she was gonna be homeless. She was pretty much she's about to be homeless. She had nowhere to go. She didn't have a family. Her husband and her were just on bad terms, and um." he's seen the dollar signs as well. And I said, if we do this deal, you can have 60% of the profits. Give me 40% because that was a hundred thousand. And that was like 160,000 for him. And then, you know, I said, I don't care, bro, but you have to pay for the renovations. You have to pay for everything because I, I didn't have the money. Like mm -hmm. now you that deal, raise some money. Yeah. Now that deal is a true example of when you can get a deal with $0 because I didn't put in, one dime of my own money, not mm -hmm. a dollar, but I brought somebody over a hundred thousand dollars worth of, um, revenue for sure. And she agreed and we paid her monthly. So, um, I made revenue, uh, every month from the rent cause, um, we got a tenant in there and they lived there for a year. So we fixed it up, we rented it out for a year. And then I told them like, hey, you know, in the agreement, we let's agree that we'll rent it out and then we'll sell it after one year. And that's what we did. And the, you know, then we paid her off the rest of the money that we owed her. And mm -hmm. that's has a big thing to do with how I got where I am now, bro. Creative, creative deal making. Yeah, I mean, it's the less, like a less traditional route, but essentially it has all the components. You find a good deal, you make a good deal with the seller, you make a good deal with the money partner, you get the thing turned around, stabilized, you have a good contract, you execute the contract, you get out, you get paid. 
Like that's, that's like uh, real estate one oh one. but the way you went about it could have been a little bit like typically is like, Oh, you find it, you wholesale it, someone buys it. The person moves out, they fix it, they sell it right away. But you know, in, in a roundabout way, that's essentially what you guys uh, pulled off. So, you know, that, is that the biggest deal that you've been able to put together so far? <clears throat> oh, so far. Yeah. That, that that's definitely the biggest deal, man. I haven't hit a six figure deal since that, <laughs> since that yeah, one. Man, that, like but, that's like a home run. Like I'm just worried myself. I just want to get on base all the time, you know, 10 K, 10 K, 50 K, 10 K, 20 K, something like that. Get on base. So has that experience influenced your approach to future real estate deals and opportunities? Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, when you, I mean, you know, you obviously have to take risks, but to answer your question, yes. Cause you have more of a resume mm -hmm. when you're out there and you're, you know, selling yourself, you're selling your business, you know, you have the potential, you have the background, you know what I mean? Like you can't be a football coach if you never played football or, yeah. you know, you can't tell us what to do if you've never done it. So. Yeah, definitely. So how important would you say self-discipline is so far in your career, you know, maintaining that daily routine and those decision-making processes as far as self-discipline is concerned? That's number one, man. That is definitely number one because, you know, I went from working third shift when I'm with tons of coworkers and I'm a super people person, man. Like, mm -hmm. you know, just from, for one, I, like I said, I get it from my dad. So that's number one. Number two is just, I'm just a nice person. So let's add that in. Let's add me, yeah. you know, and then for number three, what I've been through. So you put all those together and, uh, you know, I don't mean to boast about myself too much, but I'm usually like everybody's friend, but it could be a bad thing as well. But I'm used to being on so many people and now I'm in like, this is, this is my office right here. And it's, you know, it's usually just me. So it's hard yeah. to be your own boss all the time, dude. I'm sure you know it's like you know doing podcasts all the time. Yeah, you know I, I mean, mean I, there's no there's no uh, fancy studio. It's just uh, you know it's podcast, but it's about the content, you know, with the podcast. But I hear what you're saying too with real estate. Um, I when I whenever like in my career, I've worked in offices and in call centers and you know hundreds of other people and yep. you know like it gives you some energy that you're not like alone in a box, but real estate, sometimes you're, you literally like your office, you are alone in a box um, and your phone, right? Rarely are people coming in there. Sometimes you go out, but it's not like there's a huge team, especially at the beginning, you know, you can get a team going, but um, a lot of times it is just like a uh, lone ranger, you know, your horse, your car, yep. your gun, your pen, and uh, you're out there looking for the next opportunity, right? Yeah, you couldn't have said it any better, man. It's, you, you know, it's me versus me. <laughs> yeah. So what sort of daily routine do you put in place to make sure that you're staying on top of your business, making sure things are going? <clears throat> well, right now, um, I use Chad GPT, you know, just mm -hmm. like we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah. And I just, you know, I... I said if i can work for amazon and i can clock in for amazon there's no reason why i should because you know i got a little lax of days ago because i had to you know have you ever read the book called atomic habits uh yes actually yeah it's a while ago yeah. probably five years yeah. ago though yeah so i'm like all right i gotta figure this out it's a whole new life like literally an entire yeah. new life i'm starting so i found a phone app that you can clock in and clock out so when i when i come into the office i clock in you know but i clock oh, like in once for I start your head doing space stuff. right you're clocking in for yourself that's dope exactly you know and i told myself i clocked in for amazon like why if i can clock in for jeff bezos why can i clock in for jimmy jackson so mm -hmm. and then i use chat gpt to make a schedule which you know you can talk to chat gpt like it's you you can just you know yeah. well, so, i use them as an assistant i create assistants for my different things and actually just like the, hey what should i do today what 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 do you think of that so yeah i get that for sure and yep and i had it put me together a schedule and it it even put breaks in there like it put a i got it up I'm right up here up against my wall it has break time and lunch time and 
you know, the it's just once again staying disciplined to that schedule because at work your manager comes and tells you it's break time. Your manager tells you why were you late for not clocking in when here, you know, you still have to stick to that routine. And I read a lot. I do I like to read a lot of books and I like to meditate and I I love meditation, bro. I think meditation is amazing. Motivational speeches, Eric Thomas motivational speeches. Mm-hmm. things like that bro is what i try to keep my brain focused on so so you know with everything you've done in real estate you know what's your unfair advantage what comes easy to you that other people find difficult to do i'm a people person and i gain people tell me that i read a book called emotional intelligence yeah and I've, i always wondered like what is it about like who am i you know what i mean like i guess how does my brain work? Because of my epilepsy, I like the brain. I like how the brain works. It's like a computer. And mm-hmm. I won't even get into that because it's a whole nother topic. But um, And in that book, I, I read that different people have different personalities. And there's something called a, a chameleon. And a chameleon is a person who can change his tone, change his personality when he's around different people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. if someone is, if I'm around somebody and he's saying, dude, I'll be, you know, I, I'll I'll switch up to dude or, you know, mm-hmm. if there's bro, if they're bro, excuse my language, but if it's like, what's good, my nigga, I'm what's good, my nigga, <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's just where well, I'm at. It probably and- helps a lot too when you're dealing with sellers too. I find that um, whenever I'm dealing with sellers, you kind of pick up what they're putting down and like you're in that, you're in their world. So you're like participating in their reality and how the dialogue's going, you know, like, if they're drinking beer and they ha- and they hand you a beer, what do you do? Do you do you do you drink that beer with them or do you say no thanks? Well, no, I'll I'll drink the beer with them when in Rome, right? Exactly, man. So, what does the future look like? You know, what where are you going from here? Well, the the person that I'm learning from, um, I look at him right now like you know, like a mentor. And Mm -hmm. I I like what he does. He gets properties all over. Mm -hmm. He knows tons of loopholes, tricks. And I want to get properties outside of Michigan. Mm. Uh, That's my ultimate goal. But um, I guess my next step that I'm focusing on right now is passive income. You know, I I need more passive income because since I, I left my job, um, I have a set stone of income right now that I'm using mm-hmm. for marketing and, you know, uh, to like we just purchased a property in Muskegon. Uh, it's been probably six weeks ago now and we're almost finished with it to put it up. We got it for a great price. So I'll probably get another like another, you know, um, um, set amount, I guess. I don't know. That's probably wasn't the best way to say it, but another thing I don't have passed to the bottom line to put in the bank and live off of. Yeah. That's, that's the real <laughs> yeah. estate investor life. Right. So it's like, how long yeah. can you stretch that out? And that's why a lot of people, they do have like a blend. They'll have uh buy and hold properties with some partners so that they got like s- some base income or their house hacking so that someone's paying their rent. And then they don't have to have that pressure to, you know, put gas in the car to keep the lights on, you know, they got other money coming in. So are you looking in the Michigan area then to get some duplexes, some fourplexes? What What's the plan there? Yeah, that's definitely what I want. I want to, I, I want to work my way up to commercial real estate, man. I want to, you know, get duplexes, fourplexes and work all the way up to, to the top, man, because it, it, it's crazy, bro. Like, if you get all these houses, like, I'm sure you've been on a plane. Like, I was taking, I was mm-hmm. on a flight one time going to Atlanta, and um, I was I was huge. going to see if, yeah, bro, I was looking out the plane, and I'm like, huge. you get four of those properties, dude. That's it, four. And yeah. you're worth a million dollars. That's it, four, dude. Yeah, and there's so many. I think, it, I think when I was... Cause we were going through Florida and we were going through uh, Miami, right? If you've ever been to Miami, you can tell how big a city is by how many lanes the interstate going into Miami is. And we're driving and I'm like, this has to be like nine lanes in both directions. So I go on Google. I'm like, what's a, po- what's the like greater area Miami population. And it's like 12 million. And I'm like, okay, 
there's probably like 10 houses in there for me. You know, like 12 million people, 6 million houses minimum, let's say half of the people, you know, if they all paired up. Um, yeah, like, why can't you get four? Why can't you get yeah. 10 or 100? Yeah. You know, uh, that's the beauty of of the United States. You know, here in Canada, 40 million people nationally. America, 440 million people nationally. So you guys are like 10x the properties. Um and that's and you still have great property areas. Like you look at places like Tennessee, you look at places like Kansas City, you look at places like Cleveland and the Ohio area. You can buy a duplex for 30 grand and the rent's still 950 per side. So it's like, how do you how do you decide? Are you working in Michigan because you're in Michigan? Um, yeah, I'm in well, right now Grand Rapids is like been recognized for like the past five years as we were like number one city to move in then we were like number three then we were like number but like we, we've been in the top five cities in the entire united states growing oh, and wow. uh de yeah and like developing but uh which i mean i'm sure you probably know this but like right now the united states is i mean people have their perspective they call it gentrification True, you know yeah. what i mean i'm I really don't believe in too much of the gentrification. I'm not really into all that type of stuff, but it depends on how risky you are, bro. Like if you think you go buy a property in Detroit and depend oh, on how much money you have, you know, if you can afford to buy four properties in Detroit and you can afford to let them sit for a little while, because Detroit's not going to be a, a slum for too much longer. Like people are going to start investing in yeah. that city you know what i mean and you can let it sit well it's just got it's got the infrastructure right and so people to are Detroit, gonna move you know back I mean? in right so they're gonna move back in eventually it's just when it's the same with cleveland you know 2008 it oh, went yeah, from 1.1 million to 480,000 people they just left so there's just houses upon houses upon houses just empty so if you want a thirty thousand dollar house i saw someone on zillow the other day 15 grand so you know don't let don't let the amount of money you have hold you back from getting in the game. You just might have to take a plane to Cleveland. And if you're in the United States, domestic air travel, like you can go 47 bucks on spirit back and forth, you know, like you can go yeah. for a weekend and hang out and see what it's out there because you're within the United States, you're within the borders, there's property everywhere. Now, are you seeing um, the prices inflating as you are top five in the country? Are you seeing supply and demand getting a little crazy bidding wars every wholesaler in town wants a piece of the action you know what's the what's the scene like in the market like now that people are you know you're getting on the top five list everyone wants to go yeah there definitely is bidding wars the prices are way higher than what they were when i was a kid um the city has changed there's tons of new investments they're buying up old warehouses and turning them in two apartments i moved to orlando for like a year and came back and was walking around downtown like yeah they're turning all those warehouses downtown. right in that rust belt they're turning like cleveland did a great job if you want to look for a really cool kind of thing that they did they took all the old warehouses and now they're all like you know one bedroom condos 12 stories high brick hardwood floors and mm -hmm. uh you know what else are you going to do with them they don't need them like that anymore but People want to live in there. So um, you're seeing that a lot going on. So what are you raising money for these days? What's your plan? What are you investing in, let's say, in the next six months? Right now, my main focus is the uh, creative seller financing. I'm focusing a lot on that. Yeah. Do you follow Pace Morby at all? I do. And let me get, let, just for the listeners at home, for Canadians who don't know, you can get a 15 and 30 year fixed rate mortgage, correct? Oh, yeah. You, you cannot do that in Canada. Our max is no. five years. So, how every five years, we have to rebid on the interest rate. So, how is that an investment, right? If you lock in, because you've got people who have had great mortgages and you can keep those mortgages for like 10 years. So that's why sub two works so well in the States because your mortgage structure lets that happen in Canada. You know, every three to five years, you got to go back to the bank and say, what's the new rate? So it could be 8%, could be 2%. So your numbers change all the time, like overnight, like in, in buy and hold real estate, five years, 
that's just when you're starting to like stabilize and make money. But in now we got to get a new interest rate. Now we got to get a new interest rate every five years, max, max loan time. So you can see why wow. you don't hear about people with like, oh, I got a thousand properties in Canada. Well, why would you do that? You got to change the interest rates every five years. And so right now, the big challenge in Canada is everyone's having to renew that five-year rate on, uh, you know, these huge properties, right? Wow, man, that would be very frustrating. <laughs> having yeah, to now they that. had a 2% rate. Now they're renewing at a 7. Commercial's like oh. 7.85. So there's all your cash flow. You're probably cash flow negative. Like, and now rents are going through the roof. They're talking about affordable housing. But now rents are going through the roof because everyone, all the landlords, they got to get a new rate. They got to get a new rate every three to five years. So Pace Morby's program works really well in the United States because someone's locked in for 15. You can make projections. You can build a business on that. Right. It's, I mean, generally people, they usually get like 30 year here. Yeah, a 30 year, even yeah. better. I mean, because I mean, a lot of times 15 is usually what I have been taught and like here is usually like a commercial. So it's like every, it's, it's almost like everybody It's like everybody usually has a 30, like I'd say probably 90. Can't even, you can't even get that. The only thing you can get, I think is like uh, with the government, you can get a 40 year rate. That's it. But you have to play with the government on a multifamily building. Otherwise you go to the regular bank. It's five years max. Maybe yeah. seven on a, some special product, but five years, every five years, you got to turn over your mortgage. I wonder why they do that, man. Like that, it seems like it doesn't make sense. Is it just greed or they're just constantly? I think it has something to do with like <clears throat> America does this boom and bust thing where like sometimes the whole economy goes down the toilet and there's tons of properties coming up for sale, foreclosures, you know, everyone's losing their house, losing their shirt. But in Canada, they, they watched, we watched the United States and we say, okay, let's not do that. Like in 2008, we didn't have that sort of deal go on. So we were kind of shielded from that because we weren't doing the same like 0%. Um, you guys were pretty much like 0% down housing for a while. And, you know, zero down housing had a lot of people go into foreclosure. So Canada was like, no, we're not doing that. So usually we're usually looking at the states going, okay, let's take the best parts of it and maybe try to mitigate the risk. Cause we're like very socialist up here. We're always trying to mitigate the risk in the States. They're like, here's some rope, go hang yourself in Canada's like, no, <laughs> right. you're not smart enough to hold the rope. So we're going to hold, we're going to give you little pieces of it. You know, not enough to hang yourself. That's the whole mentality up here. Don't give them enough to hang themselves. Cause we're not smart enough to make decisions for ourselves, I guess. But that's where real capitalism comes in America, where you can go in and you can come out, you make a bunch of money, make 160 grand or 100 grand on a weird mortgage thing where you can get in and get out. That just isn't a thing here. So the game's different. People make money up here all day in real estate, but it's not the same. Uh, it's not the same game. So, well, I got a quick question. Um, did you hear about the commission? uh commission lawsuits that are going on right now and the battles that are starting to happen with the uh the realtors um something like back commissions retroactive commissions or something like that i was hearing but i don't i don't know much about it that's all that's as much information i know about it what is what is going on i mean i'll just summarize it real quick put it in just a couple words i guess but there's buyer commissions are becoming an issue now like oh, yeah. sellers like wipe it out or something yeah sellers are like why do i gotta pay for the buyer and the seller's commission because you know sellers are the are the ones who pay the six percent for the buyers and the sellers they pay both yeah. agents so i mean in real estate agents make you know they do a two hundred thousand dollar home they make $6,000 and a lot of yeah. people are like, okay, there's realtors out there who sell four homes in a month. They're making 24,000. Like, why are these people getting paid so much money? And it became a big issue. Like you're talking like multi-billion dollar issue. And now it's becoming more of an issue. Like the 
the brokerage that I work for, I seen something online today where now they're starting to ask questions. There was a, a realtor she put on to our, our like page. She said, what do you guys uh, recommend? Because I had a buyer who um, got an FHA loan. And that's, I mean, basically to summarize it, she basically said that she, her buyer don't have money to pay commission. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So she only had the money for the down payment because she got an FHA loan. So if the seller doesn't pay the commission, which the seller refused, the seller was like, I'm not paying the, I'm not paying all this. I'll pay my, my agent, but I'm not paying the buyer's agent. So the buyer's agent, she's like, how am I going to get paid? How is the buyer supposed to pay me when the buyer's getting an FHA loan? The buyer doesn't even, the buyer, buyer has barely enough money to buy this home. And they're like, oh, damn, here we go. These sellers. Well, even in, even in wholesaling, the reality is that um, the money comes off the seller side always. Like that's real estate 101. When you're selling something, there's a fee. When you're buying something, they don't, they don't charge me a fee at Best Buy when I buy a computer. I pay the price and that's it. How my money right. comes to the table. That's like, that's like my thing. So like one thing I always remember that I've got like a, a Jewish realtor and he always reminds me, he says, count your money, not theirs. And so like, maybe, maybe everyone needs a little lesson and like count your money, not theirs. And at the end of the day, like the buyer brought the deal to the table. You can, you can put a for sale sign on the front of a house that doesn't sell a house. So like the seller, the seller agent, I probably the seller agents are going to have to start paying the buyer agents. It's going to come out of the seller side. The seller is going to be the only one with the commission structure. And then the seller agent and the buyer agent are going to have to negotiate as to like, cause like if we co-sale a property, you know, like you find the deal and I bring a buyer, I'm going to put money on my side, or maybe we're just going to split whatever's on the table on your side. You know, let's, let's say there's a 20 K fee. Maybe we go 10 and 10, or maybe you say, oh, I'm keeping most of it. I'll give you five and uh, I'm keeping 15. And if I don't like that deal, I mean, who doesn't like money? But at the same time, like I didn't find the deal. I'm not the listing agent. I'm just hoping to get a piece of the action by bringing my buyer to the table. But if I don't like the deal, I might hold my buyer and their money and find a different house to, to sell them. So like seller agents better watch out too, because if they start playing games, like the reason it works is because it works. They got to stop playing games. If you pay everyone, it works. But if you start, if you start playing games with buyer agents, like reducing the commission on the, on the buying agent side, the number of showings you're going to get are going to go down. You start, you know, like, cause they're all salespeople and they're motivated by money. That's how it goes. You know, don't complain that someone made four sales as a real estate agent made 24 grand. How about if it's such a bothersome thing to the person complaining about, how much people are making first of all count your money not theirs and second of all become an agent then you don't like the game change the game you know if you're crying well, about it go be an agent then i'm gonna i'm gonna grab a calculator real quick well here's here's something else that kind of kills people so if you like let's say you have two hundred thousand dollar home and you still mm -hmm. have an equity on that property i mean i'm sorry a mortgage, mortgage. balance yeah yeah that's where it, it it's hidden sellers too, bro. Because you know they they gotta pay, you know you gotta they gotta the pay loan, the yeah. closing costs. Yeah, you know they they gotta pay the closing costs. Then they gotta pay both agents. Then they gotta pay mm -hmm. taxes. Then they gotta pay their remaining pay. Like, so they, you 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 know what I'm saying? Like they still like they so are you pro? Are you pro or are you pro or against the idea? <laughs> to be honest, bro, I am. Like I said, man, I'm too much of a nice person, man. So I'm kind of like you gotta have an stuck opinion, in the middle. Which way? Like which way are you gonna go, pro or con? Because I'm, man. I'm, I'm con this. I think you should leave it alone. I think that the open market will navigate itself. I think AI might replace buying agents altogether, so it might not even be an issue in five years. But um, do you know, hey, hey, bro? Do you know how they say that there's always something new that comes along? Mm -hmm. So. That's what I mean. I'm not pro or I'm not con. I am going, I'm steering right because I think creative sales finance is going to be the new thing. I think it's going to be oh, the yeah. new way. No more banks. You know what Just I mean? Just keep trading yeah, because houses. Exactly. Because like I have a friend, I have friends who are realtors and if I can go to them and say, Hey, you know, you got this $200,000 home and you're, you don't, you know, you might have to deal with a buyer 
and his agent or whatever, well, what if I can give you 6% commission, I can give the seller a down payment, and I can pay for the closing costs. You know, we just have to do it through my business, and we don't have to deal with any lenders. We don't have to deal with any banks. You can just do it through a... Um, I can get transaction coordinators and, you know, we can put it on promissory notes and just like everything Pace talks about, you you follow Pace. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's going to become a higher trend. I think it's going to become the new norm, kind of like, Well, certainly you know, with uh, the interest AI. rates, right? Like yeah, people don't yeah. want to go get a new interest rate. They don't want to lock in 30 years at 5%, 6%, buy the old mortgage. And that's what I, I, I said this to another guy. We were talking about this and. I said the banks better get straight or they're going to get cut out of the business. And I think oh, you're yeah. feeling it too. Oh yeah. And you can make your own interest rates. All you need is a mortgage calculator. So if I bust out a mortgage calculator and I'm like, Hey Bryce, you know, what if we do 1.5% and then but they owe nothing. The maybe they owe nothing on the house. You know, they have a, a free and clear asset that they can leverage and make up their own mortgage. They don't even have to pay exactly. the existing one. They have nothing on it. So you can make a whole new one. And that's like a note, right? You're doing note business now. Yep, exactly. When all you need is promissory notes. And, you know, if people people who get weary or nervous, you just have to show them the credibility and you're good to go, man. So I just, I, that's what, so like, as far as the pro and the con, um, I, I more am just ready for the new wave. Yeah. Because I see people are, are going to be, are going to be, I think people are going to be, they lose money either way. And I'm for money. I want to make money and I want to help everybody make money. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if, uh, if people want to connect with you, they want to find out more, um, what should they do? How do they find you? Um, you can find me on, uh, Facebook, Jimmy Jackson, like you see, you know, right under my name, uh, it's, but it's Jimmy Jackson Jr. Mm. And you can also go, I have a website. It's uh, jisinvestments.com. And you can also um, check me out on my Facebook page. If you go on to my, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. If you go onto my Facebook page, I have a page called um, Jackson investment solutions that's my hmm. that's the name of my business jackson investments uh solutions and i also uh, would like to throw this out there i started a, a real estate course mm -hmm. as well that i'm just i just started it in january it's just the basic courses just you know it's not anything that is like like it don't has it doesn't have any like credibility for anyone to get their realtor's license it's just teaching people the basics that you and i talked about right now but like in a more in-depth mm -hmm. thing for somebody who was like myself when i was just learning to teach them things a lot faster and if you were to go on my uh jisinvestments.com website you could sign up for that class right there or mm -hmm. you can do affiliate marketing on that class as well so mm -hmm. if you were to get anybody signed up you get paid a commission mm -hmm. and it's just you know people who want to learn the basics you know what I mean? It's like, I, I guess it's kind of like um, trying to, excuse me, it's learning how to ride a bike with the training wheels. Because mm -hmm. if you don't understand the words that Bryce and I use, if we say escrow account or promissory note, you're not yeah. going to understand what we're saying. So if you take, like, if you take my class and you, you can at least understand what, you know, you and I are talking about. Learn the language. Before yeah. you try to watch the podcast. So if awesome, that makes sense. Awesome. So yeah, I really appreciate you stopping by. We could go, we could probably go another 35 an hour maybe, but uh, I think it's better if That's they cool. connect with you directly and, uh, you know, see how that goes. So I really appreciate you stopping by, Jimmy. Oh, no problem, man. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for the invite. Yeah. And until next time, guys, we'll catch you on the next episode. Hey there. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And as always, if you want to listen to more daily interview content, make sure you subscribe. And if you're an active real estate investor and you're doing deals and you'd like to get featured on this show, then just head over to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now at MoneyPartnerFormula.com, we help real estate investors to create a process for predictably getting capital so they can do more deals without relying on hard money lenders or the banks. We do this by building them a private capital marketing system. Now, if you want help turning yourself into a big money capital attraction machine, then book a call with our team to see how we can help. 
Just visit moneypartnerformula.com to find out more. All right, take care, and we'll see you on the next interview.